Around a third of the global population is currently living under lockdown as governments take extraordinary measures to contain the spread of coronavirus. Sweden is one of the few countries in Europe to have resisted these kinds of measures. Even its Scandinavian neighbours, Norway and Denmark, have closed their borders and placed strict restrictions on everyday activities. We're joined down the line by Natalie Rothschild, a journalist based in Stockholm. Natalie, it's Thursday afternoons we record. Um, can you tell us a bit about what the situation is like in Sweden at the moment? Uh, I'd say the situation is pretty dire, actually. Um, I guess everything is relative, but we still have um, you know, a situation where we're facing mass unemployment. Whole industries are at a standstill. Markets have been <laughs> crashing. The economy is in free fall. Lots of people have had to change the way they live, their everyday lives working from home, not seeing elderly people and so on. And yeah, obviously there are limits on traveling, even if borders are not entirely shut. It's very difficult to travel at the moment. But in general, I mean, it is it is more open and people have kind of, I suppose, the characterization of it as open for business, I suppose, is, is wrong, as you've illustrated. But it, it hasn't gone down the same kind of path as, as everyone else. Is that noticeable? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to compare on a personal level since I'm only here and can't go anywhere else. But I think a sort of caricatured image has emerged in international media, this open for business line, which I'm aware was in the headline of an article I wrote. But, uh, you know, we're often not responsible for uh, the titles of our articles, the editors are. But life is not, you know, what it was three weeks ago. But Obviously, compared to other European countries and uh, countries uh, beyond Europe, we're still pretty free. I mean, the most noticeable difference is that there is no quarantine. There's no enforced quarantine. We don't have a limit on the number of walks we can take every day. And most of the measures that have been taken are formulated as recommendations uh, rather than uh, legal impositions. With a few exceptions, Uh, for instance, there's now a restriction on public gatherings of 50 people or more. It was 500 to begin with, and they lowered it to 50. And high schools and universities are closed, and they're doing remote teaching, but other schools and preschools are still open. Tom? I was just wondering about what the kind of debate within Sweden is like at the moment. Is there a lot of pressure for the government to go much further, for more restrictions to be brought in? And if so, where is that kind of pressure coming from? Because I think I've read in a couple of places that almost the inverse, it feels like, as to what we're experiencing here in Britain. It's often people on the left or the liberal left who tend to be more um, in favour of this slightly less restrictive measures, as you say, whereas it's people on the right who are calling for more of a clamp down. Is that a fair characterization, or what really is the state of the debate in that respect? It's it's kind of strange how this issue has turned into a left right issue when it's you know a question of uh, public health and uh, a pandemic. But people, you know what it's like when people place their stakes in the public debate on on social media and in, uh, in opinion pieces and so on. They feel pretty strongly about kind of digging themselves further in the trenches and then people are sticking to their positions. But I think the the more interesting contrast is between. The debate, very fierce debate that's going on in media and social media, uh, where there's a lot of distrust in the public health agency, which is front and center of Sweden's strategy to to combat this virus, and the approval ratings that the public health agency is receiving in opinion polls, where the public actually has apparently a strong uh, level of trust in, in the public health agency and in its outlier strategy. Ella? I read this article in The Guardian from someone who's living in Malmo and the point they were making was that, you know, this is a country that has a lot of respect and belief in its experts. It's That's what it's kind of known for. It's got a very sensible approach. And as an observer, while many other European countries and the media within many other European countries was clamouring for a lockdown, it seemed like actually there was a more thoughtful argument coming out of the experts in Sweden that were saying, you know, you implement strict measures when it matters because the understanding is that you can't keep people in isolation or quarantine or some form of lockdown for a long time. I mean, has that has that changed? Because from what you've said, it now sounds that actually things have become a lot stricter uh, quite suddenly. It's not that they've become stricter, but obviously they're adding, as the situation kind of escalates, they're adding uh, recommendations 
remember, the, these are not legal uh, requirements. We don't have emergency legislation and, and that kind of thing. So, for instance, from this week, there's a ban on visits to elderly homes. And as I said, the public gatherings, the, num- the maximum number was lowered from 500 to 50. And, you know, but still, relative to other countries in Europe and beyond, that's still pretty tame. So the recommendations become stronger as, as the situation escalates. But I think what's hard to get across even within Sweden, is that the approach to this is very much in line with some traditions that are quite specific to this country. And so, for instance, we have a ban on uh, ministerial rule, which exists in Sweden, also in Finland, because Sweden and Finland uh, were once the same country, uh, and doesn't exist, for instance, in neighboring uh, Denmark and Norway. And that means that even though the government sets the remit for public agencies, like the budget and appoints the head and so on. Beyond that, they're not allowed to meddle in the day-to-day proceedings of those public agencies, of which the public health agency is one. And there's also a strong tradition of politicians leaning on their expertise and an expectation that they will follow their recommendations. And so what people on one side of the argument have been saying here is that we're just following that tradition, whereas in other countries it's become much more political. It's politicians making the decisions. And Mm. here it's as if the public health agency is is almost a political entity. They make recommendations and the government has, until now, chosen to follow those recommendations. And they're very much in dialogue with each other. So that's one thing. The other thing is that Sweden is uh, what's called a high trust society. And that also goes for the other Scandinavian nations. This is something that's been measured in surveys and so on. It means that there's a high level of trust, mutual trust between public agencies and citizens, but also a high level of interpersonal trust. There's a kind of faith that people will uh, follow the advice of, and recommendations of agencies and, uh, and expectations on fellow citizens that they will act responsibly too. But actually, what's kind of interesting is that a few days ago, it emerged that a large number of those who've died from COVID-19 are from communities like immigrant dense suburbs. So it was a high number of Somalis who actually died. Obviously, they have a, a different lifestyle, a different culture, where, for instance, they have intergenerational living, they live um, more tightly together, they might not partake in information in Swedish, uh, in Swedish media, and they do not come from societies that are marked by a high level of trust. So you can't take for granted that that very ingrained culture that has existed in Sweden for a long time is something that will be automatically adopted by everyone who, who lives here. I think it's also important to look at the facts on the ground in terms of Sweden being a country of 10 million we're a small mm. country uh, compared to the UK, or for instance. Uh, it's quite sparsely populated. The largest number mm-hmm. of cases is in Stockholm, which obviously is the most densely populated place. But even then, the capital city has an, a million and a half people. We have the highest number of single households in the world. And there's no tradition of intergenerational living, not much crowded housing situations and that kind of thing. So we also have better kind of premises from which to act in a more liberal, let's say, or more allowing manner, in addition to the the norms and the cultural attitudes and this Mm -hmm. tradition of independent public agencies and that kind of thing. So we have advantages that other countries don't have in that sense. And also the fact that, you know, it's kind of a antisocial culture. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, social distancing is not as much of a, uh, you know, issue here as it might be in, you know, Italy or more warm blooded (laughs) <laughs> Tom, do you want to throw in a final question? Well, I suppose it would just be interesting to get your sense, Natalie, of where things might be headed next. You know, do you see Sweden going down more of that kind of authoritarian path? You know, where do you see the next few weeks kind of panning out as much as any of us can predict anything at this point? And there are so many armchair epidemiologists <laughs> out there. I don't really want to join the the numbers, but I, I really don't know. I think I, I kind of swing from you know, one morning I wake up and think, oh, you know, Sweden's doing the right thing. And the next day you're sort of inundated with information. You, you look at all the curves and you, you know, 
I think, oh, we're now, we're actually was so and so many weeks ago. Is this really the right thing? And, you know, it's, I, I find it really difficult to know, but I think what the authorities, I mean, for me, one of their biggest mistakes was not communicating all of this uh, in a very clear uh, manner to start with. And so now that they're being questioned by international journalists and also by Swedish journalists who who don't really get what their strategy is, they've had to actually formulate what I was just talking about in terms of, you know, how uh, Sweden has a ban on ministerial rule and how we, you know, we trust people to follow recommendations and act responsibly and do their duty and, and, and have a sense of solidarity and that kind of thing. They've actually started to be more explicit about that. And so the conversation has kind of shifted to acknowledge those factors, whereas before it was just a kind of disbelief in what do we know that all these other countries don't know and that kind of thing. And even people who are very familiar with and born into this culture weren't really getting what they were doing and why. And so they've become a lot clearer in their communication. But I I still can't judge whether it's the right way to go or not in all instances. But obviously, I very much appreciate not being locked in. Uh, I mean, I work from home, but I can go out. And if I do feel like it, coffee shops are open and that kind of thing. Obviously, that's very nice. And I, I do hope that we don't go down the same route that other countries have done in terms of severe restrictions on freedoms. The time will tell. <laughs> 